Okay, last time we had an introduction to JavaScript and we talked about um, the purpose of JavaScript and that is by and large to take an existing web page and to alter it without having to reload a whole brand new web page. All right, there's a number of advantages to being, being able to do this. Number one, it gives an immediate response. You don't have to wait for the server to process your request and send back a response. If the JavaScript code is already on the client, then as soon as the user makes an action, the response can be immediate. So again, the classic example we gave is the mouse over effect on, for, for menus on ESPN.com. And notice how virtually immediately, as you put your mouse over these items, the drop-down appears. All right? It uh, clearly isn't reloading the entire page, because when this page loads, as you notice, it takes a second for it to load. All right? Well, then it takes longer than that. All right, when this page loads, it takes a second to load. And yet, when we do our mouse over effect, it's instantaneous. All right. This is accomplished through JavaScript. And JavaScript, as you remember, really has, um, for, for this sort of JavaScript, which is pretty typical, you typically have a user event that gets the ball rolling, that triggers it. And it's typically anything the user can interact with the web page. So pressing a keys, moving the mouse, pressing the mouse, all those things are user events that can be captured and code can be written to do something to change the page. The document object model is what we use to refer to the parts of the page that we want to change. We can point to any element on the page and there's a number of ways to do it. Probably the most straightforward way to do it is via the ID. Um, remember, an ID needs to be unique, so it should only point to one thing on the page. And as we click on something or mouse over to something, we can point to something and then change some of the attributes to it. Now remember, the attributes that we can access in JavaScript are the same attributes that exist in CSS, the same attributes that ex uh, exist in HTML. And this is the example we had last time. And I want to open this up in Chrome. I may already have it open in Chrome. I do. All right, what does HTML stand for? Show answer, hide answer, show answer, hide answer. That, I'm, I'm just done. All right, we'll see up in... <laughs> no, just kidding. We can show answer, hide answer, show answer, hide answer. And here's the different pieces. First of all, we have an on-click event on the button. All right. First of all, it's a type equals button, not type equals submit, because we're not sending it to a server-side script to be processed. We're simply invoking some JavaScript. On-click is one of the predefined events that you can interact with the page with. So when I click on this button, I want something to happen. Document get element by ID ANS1 is a way to point to something on the screen. What this says is give me the thing on the page that has an ID of ANS1. So document means on this page. You can actually write um, JavaScript to, to like if you have a pop-up window. You can manipulate that pop-up window. All right. So that's why it's important to say on this page, not some other window that popped up. So document means on this page. Get element by ID means find the thing on this page that has this ID. And in that case, it is this paragraph here. All right. And then 
once we point to it, what do we want to change about it? We want to change the style of it. What about the style that we want to change? We want to change the visibility. And what do we want to set the, set the visibility to? We want to set the visibility to visible. All right? The same property there. But the only difference you run into is if you have a dash in the property name in CSS, you don't use the dash. You omit the dash and capitalize the next word. So instead of background dash color, in JavaScript you'd say background color with the C capitalized. This one works the same, except we're pointing to a different element on the page. We're not pointing to this paragraph. We're pointing to this paragraph. And same thing. We point to it. Um, we say we want to change its style. What about the style we want to change? We're going to change the visibility. What do we want to set it to? Visible. And the hide button does the same thing except it sets the visibility to hidden. All right. Now, how can JavaScript go wrong? JavaScript can go wrong a number of different ways. First of all, one of the, and again, unlike, we had a discussion a couple uh, classes back about how a good thing about HTML is if you make a mistake with it, it doesn't break your whole page. All right? In JavaScript, if you make a mistake in JavaScript, um, things are going to blow up and it's, it's not going to work necessarily the way that you expected it to. One of the most common mistakes that people make is, is forgetting or ignoring that JavaScript is case sensitive. So for example, document get element by ID needs to be typed in exactly like that. Document with a lowercase, get element by ID. The first letter of the first word is lowercase. Each subsequent word, is, the first letter is uppercase. But if I said something like this, get element by ID, like that, all right, it's going to blow up, all right? So I click that, it doesn't show the answer anymore. Now, debugging JavaScript can be difficult, all right? But there's some tools that you can use to help you find out exactly what went wrong. Keeping in mind that it's not going to come out and say, hey, you need to make that a lowercase d. It's going to give you some information about what exactly happened and why you got the error, but you sometimes have to interpret exactly what it means. How do you see these error messages? If you go to here in Google Chrome, it's a little bit different in each browser. You can go to More Tools, Developers Tools, and you can look up at the console. And this is actually a fairly descriptive error message. It says document get element by ID is not a function. So you might think, well, wait a minute, we use that in class. That is a function. Well, it's a function when it's spelled correctly. And in this case, um, what we have is, is it needs to be um, a, a lowercase d. So if we go and correct that, we're back in business. What if I spell this wrong? If I say ANS instead of ANS1? This error is a little more cryptic. It says, can't read property style of null. All right. Now, again, that may seem a little confusing, but if you read between the lines, it actually makes sense. For one thing, at the very least, it points to you what line of code it is. And this is in line 14, which is actually this line. Whenever you see the word null, it means that something doesn't exist that should exist. In this case, what this is telling you is 
that I try, the, the browser tried to find the thing on the page called ANS, but couldn't find it. All right, therefore it returned a null. And therefore, since it can't find it, it returns nothing. You can't change the style of nothing. You can't set the visibility of something that isn't there. So that's essentially, in a nutshell, what this error means. That you cannot find the style property of nothing. And the reason is, is you didn't get the ID right. Another thing is notice the use of quotes here. I use double quotes to go around the entire JavaScript statement that's part of the onClick event. Within the quotes, though, I use single quotes. If I were to forget and use double quotes, we're going to have a mess on our hands. And it, it tells us in a very undescriptive way that there's an unexpected token. What that means is it hits some characters it doesn't know what to do with. In a nutshell, when it sees a starting quote, it thinks that this is the end of the JavaScript statement. And clearly that's not the end of the JavaScript statement. Therefore, we use single quotes inside of it to indicate that that's not the end of the JavaScript statement, that's just the um, name of the ID. That's what's called a literal. In other words, it's not a command, it's not a property or a function or anything, it's literally those exact letters. All right, questions about this so far? It's a good idea to take a systematic approach to de debugging now. Um, one thing that I see so many students do is if their program doesn't work, they simply stare at it. Thinking if they stare at it long enough and hard enough, the answer will jump out of their screen and, and tell them what's wrong. Use the tools that are, at, are, are available for you. Now, this isn't a class that focuses on JavaScript, but Firefox, for example, has a neat little debugger where you can actually step through line by line and see exactly what's going on. At the very least, check to see what the error messages are. And remember what some of the common errors are, that you, you misspell something or you get the, the um, letters incorrect um, as far as case, capital or, or lowercase, and, and so on. All right. Now, the one thing we said we were going to do, so I might as well do it today. I was debating whether we should do it today or, or do it on Monday, but we'll do it today, is to make this work with just one button uh, per question instead of two buttons per question. In other words, make a button that's capable of both showing and hiding um, that. In other words, if the answer is hidden, it will show it. If the answer is, sh is, is, is visible, it will hide it. All right, so we can do this with one button. And I'm going to start out by going back to a one question quiz. Then later on we'll go and add the second question back in. And I'm going to eliminate one of the buttons. So right now, this is what we get, or this is what we have. What does HTML stand for? If I click the button, it shows it. I now want the button's behavior to change, so if I click it, it will hide it. In addition, it would be cool that if I click the button, the button itself changed from saying show answer to hide answer, the text of the button. So we'll try to address that as well. Now, this is a little more complicated than our previous example. All right? 
And again, if you don't follow this uh, completely, that's okay. Uh, I don't expect you to be a, an expert in JavaScript um, as a result of this class. But this might be easier for you to follow those of you that have done programming in other languages because it's not really um, that complicated. It just involves if statements um, that you've seen in, in other programming languages. In a nutshell, what we want to do is if it's visible and we click the button, we want to hide it. If it's invisible when we click the button, we want to show it. So we want to do two things. And we want to do two things based on some condition. We're not always doing the same thing. We have a condition. If something's true, we do one thing. If something's not true, we do something else. In programming, that is an if statement. And you may have seen if statements already um, if you've done Excel, like in the 121 class. There's if statements in Excel that would say that, well, if one condition is true, then use this formula. Otherwise, if another condition is true, then use this other formula. All right, so that's very common in programming logic. What we're going to do is we're going to make it so that if the button is visible already, it's going to hide it. If the button is invisible, it's going to show it. Now, we could put all that code right here as part of the on-click event. But we're going to have three or four lines of code, all right? Maybe more, maybe five or six by the time we get done. I'm going to change the value of the button to show hide for now because the same button is going to do both for now. But we're going to have four, five, six lines of code. I could put them all in here and separate them by semicolons. That would get to be extremely difficult to read. So what we're going to do is we're going to call a function. All right. What's a function? A function in JavaScript is like functions in other programming languages. Essentially, you write a set of instructions and you give a name to it. That way I can just say, instead of saying, um, having all the instructions here, I can go and I can call those. You know, just say, go and do this thing. And this thing consists of three or four instructions. <clears throat> so, that's what I'm going to do here. All right. Now, there's other advantages to functions too. It allows you to put all your code in one place so it's easier to read. Um, and if you write functions well, you can reuse those functions. So that you could write maybe one function that handles showing and hiding of all the buttons on the page just by writing a function correctly. So what I'm going to do though is I'm going to start small and I'm going to create a function. Function should appear in the head section. It will be in a script tag. All right. Script tag is similar to a style tag, right? A style tag tells a browser that you're not in HTML land anymore, you're in CSS land. A script tag tells the browser you're not in HTML land anymore, you're in JavaScript land. So everything between the two script tags is going to be JavaScript. Yes? So does that mean that you can JavaScript Yeah, you can do that as well. All right. So you can put JavaScript code in, 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 in its own file, just like you can put CSS code in its own file. All right. And that's especially useful if you have um, a set of JavaScript functions that you want to reuse on different pages, which a lot of times you will, because you might have some behavior that's common for a whole bunch of pages. All right. We're taking a simpler case now where, just like we did uh, in the early days uh, of this course where we put the style tag right in there, we're going to put the script tag right in there. So, I'm going to create a function. This is a shell of a function. We have the word function. We have the name of the function. In this case, I've called it show hide button one. That is also case sensitive, like all of JavaScript. 
I have parentheses, one second, that indicate arguments, which we'll get to it a little bit. Then finally, the braces indicate the starting and ending of the function. Yes? You could do it that way as well. Yeah, there's a couple of different ways that you can define a function. Um, uh, in other words, you could say what you're saying is something like this. Show hide button 1 equals function like that. All right. Uh, absolutely, that, that's personal preference. Do, what, do what's easier, easier for you um, uh, to do that that way. Yeah, yeah, I exactly. I mean, sometimes, you know, sometimes when there's options, I can say, well, it's better to do it this way, cause I think, because of this reason. Other times, I'll look and say, well, it's just, and this is a case where I think it's just personal preference. All right, so we're going to have a new statement in here. We're going to have an if statement. And the way if, statement works, if statements work are like this. We have the word if. We have a condition. We then have, these are the statements if condition is true. Optionally, you can also have an else part to the if statement. And those will be the statements if the condition is false. Now, what do I mean by a condition? I mean a statement that is either true or false. These are called Boolean expressions. So I can compare to see if two things are equal to each other. I can compare if one thing is greater than the other. I can compare if one thing is less than the other. I can compare if is greater than or equal to, if it's not equal, if it's not greater than, and so on. All those are called logical operators, or I'm sorry, conditional operators. All right. In this case, I want to check to see if the visibility is equal to visible. I want to check to see if it's equal to visible. Now, one thing to notice here, I have a double equal sign. All right? That's confusing to a lot of people why I have a double equal sign. The equal sign in JavaScript programming actually serves two purposes. One is to do assignment. In other words, make this property have this value. That's what's called assignment. The other is to do a comparison, to say, to ask the question, does this equal that? So when you're asking the question, when you're doing a comparison, does this equal that, you use the double equal sign. All right? So, if it's already visible, then we want to hide it. So I want to set the visibility to hidden. Otherwise, if it's not visible, it must be invisible, in which case we want to make it visible. So this is how you read this. Is this statement true? Does the document, does the thing on the page that has an ID of ANS1, is its style visibility visible? That's a true or false question. Not yes, no, or maybe. It either is visible or it's not visible. If it's visible, then we want to hide it. If it's not visible, then we want to show it. So now then, 
where I have my JavaScript statement, I can just put the name of the function. Like that. All right. And when that button is clicked, it will go and it will do this statement and away we go. So I run this, starts out invisible. I click show hide button, it makes it visible. I click it again, it makes it invisible. Common errors with this, again, if you get the name of the function wrong, and remember it's case sensitive, so show hide button. If I change that to lower case, nothing happens. If I go and look at the console, it tells me show hide button one is not defined. Well, it's defined, it's just not spelled correctly. So we have to go in and correct that. Other potential problems. <clears throat> If you mess up and use a single equal sign here, it's not going to do what you think it should. Because again, the double equal sign is what's used for comparison. It doesn't give you an error either. All right. What it's doing is it's actually doing an assignment here. And it doesn't actually do the comparison, so you don't get the results that you want. <coughs> Excuse me. Another problem revolves around the braces. Notice how these braces are used. These, are, these braces are used to group things together. In other words, this function has a starting and ending brace. All right. After the word function, the name of the function, and the parentheses, you have this brace, and then you have that brace. Now, notice this is a nice feature of Notepad++. Is notice I put my mouse behind that brace, and it shows me that this brace belongs to that brace, because they're both coded as red. The other thing I could do is I could collapse this and it shows me everything that goes together. Likewise, if I put my mouse behind this brace, it shows that this ending brace corresponds to this starting brace. So if you get the number of braces wrong, it will give you an error. And it won't be a terribly descriptive error, and you have to do a little bit of poking around to figure it out. So if I were to leave this brace out, All right. Actually, I got an error right off the bat, and it doesn't work. The error I get is unexpected end of input. Well, that doesn't seem terribly descriptive. What it's telling you is it hit the end of the script tag, and it didn't get everything that it expected. In other words, there was a starting bra uh, bracket hanging out there that didn't have an ending bracket. This starting bracket does not have an ending bracket. Therefore, it hit the end of the script and didn't know what to do. Now, notice that because it didn't know what to do, it's like this function didn't exist. So therefore, when we click on the button, we also get an error saying show hide button one not defined. If you have a bad enough error, the function won't load and it will act as though that function doesn't exist. So if you are looking at your JavaScript code and um, it tells you a function doesn't exist, but you look and you see that you have a function name that, that could very well be the case, that there's a big enough error inside of it that kept it from loading. Now let's look at the opposite situation. What if I have one too many bracket?
All right. It says it got something unexpected. Wasn't expecting to get another ending bracket because all the starting brackets and ending brackets had matched up at that point. And again, there's a big enough error in that script tag that it didn't actually load that function. So even though that function's there, it acts as though it's not there. If we get this right, though, then we're back to working. Now, Right now, the button says show hide answer. We could probably do better than that, right? Wouldn't it be nice if we made the button say show at first and then change it to hide when the answer was visible? Then change it back to show when the answer was not visible. Can we do that? Well, I wouldn't have brought it up if we can't do that, right? All right. How do we do that? We follow the same recipe that we followed before. We use the DOM to point to the element. And remember, document get element by ID is going to be our workhorse here. So, I'm going to go and I'm going to put an ID on the button. ID equals BTN1. So now that has an ID. So, how do you suppose I would change this text to say hide answer if we show it? So for showing it, I want to change the text of that to say hide answer. Well, how are we going to point to it? Something on this page, document. We want to find it using the ID, right? Because that's typically the best way to find things on the page. Um, there are other ways uh, that, that come in handy in certain situations. But in this situation, we want to point to that button specifically. So I want to find the thing on the page that has that ID. What ID? Well, what did I say the ID was for that button? BTN1. What about that do I want to change? I want to change this attribute. Now that's an HTML attribute. That attribute's in HTML. That attribute is not in the CSS. Therefore, I'm not going to say document get element by ID button one. All right. Dot style. I'm going to say button or document dot get element by ID button one dot and the name of the property. And what's the name of the property? Value. It's important to know that these things that we're manipulating via JavaScript are the exact same things that are in the HTML and CSS originally. The visibility, the value of the button, and so on. It's not like there's two different kinds of properties, the ones that we set through CSS and the ones we change through JavaScript. Yes. Yes. IDs have to be unique. I don't know what it would do. Right. They do. And if you did that, um, it, it, it wouldn't I'm not sure exactly what, I, what it would do. I, my guess, we, well, we can try that in a minute here, all right? Um, I was going to say, why sit here debating what it's going to do? We'll just try it, right? But it's not going to work the way that you want it to, and you do want to make IDs unique. All right, so I can say button value equals hide. And if it's invisible, I can make the button say show. Now I know that initially it's going to be hidden, so I'm going to make initially the value show. So I click it, it goes to changes to hide, 
and it shows that, I click hide, it changes it to show and just makes it disappear. So we can change anything about the page. And when the answer is showing, we could make the paragraph yellow, and when it's not showing, we can make the paragraph green. All right? I'm not saying there'd be a real good reason for doing that, but we could do that. All right? If you do think about this, if this was a quiz um, where we actually accepted the user's answer, we could do something like if they got it right, make it green. If they got it wrong, make it red or something like that. Or put a border around it if they got it right, put a different border around it if they got it wrong. Something along those lines. Now, question about what happens if the IDs are not unique. Let's go and copy this. So now I have two IDs that aren't unique. Button one's not unique, and answer one's not unique. ANS1 is not unique. So let's see what happens. Just does the first one. All right. Just does the first one. Yeah, it, it does the first one, and if, if you can uh, imagine a browser talking to itself and, and saying, hey, look, I, you know, there's two things on this page with ID. IDs are supposed to be unique. What am I supposed to do? Well, I'll do the first one then. All right. That's my uh, imagination of what a, a browser does when it sees duplicate IDs. All right. Now, we can fix this, of course, by making these non-unique. Or making them making them unique again, rather. My mistake. And I'm going to make a second copy of this function. And it's going to work the same, except instead of looking at ANS1, let's go look at ANS2. And instead of changing button one, it's going to change button two. So now I can show the second one or hide it. I can show the first one or hide it. Now, those of you that have done any sort of programming before knows that although this works, this isn't a good solution. Why is this not a good solution to make a second copy of the function? Not much difference between the two. And, yeah, and, and uh, it adds to the size of the file, that's true. Um, the other thing is, could you imagine if there were 100 questions on this? You would have 100 functions, show button, you know, show button one, show hide button one, show hide button two, show hide button three, show hide button four. Exactly. Then if you realize that, for example, gee, we forgot to change the, the value of the button. Let's go back and change those. Well, there's a hundred places you'd have to go and change it. All right. So what do you do in programming when you have functions that are similar, but not exactly the same. Go. You make one function, all right, and use arguments, all right. And I don't want to start on arguments today because do keep in mind there's some people that haven't done any programming in this class, all right. So, um, but in a nutshell, that's what you're going to do. What an argument is is an argument is when you say, I have a function I want to do, and here's what I want to do it to. For example, square root. There's not a different function to calculate the square root of 1, and a different function to calculate the square root of 2, and a different function to calculate the square root of 3. That would kind of be ridiculous, right? There's one function that says, give me the square root, if we're talking about Excel, let's say. One function that says, give me the square root. And when you call that function, you supply it an argument. And what does the argument mean? The argument is, well, this is the thing I want to take the square root of. 
All right, so I want to take the square root of 144. I want to take the square root of 169 or, or 1,000 or whatever. All right, so there's one function and you supply the specific thing that you want that function to act upon. All right, there's one sum function in Excel. You give the range of values that you want to add up. All right, same thing with functions in JavaScript. Next Monday, we're going to rewrite this function so that there's only one show hide function. And it's going to take as an argu it's going to take two arguments, actually. What arguments do you think it's going to take? The name of the, 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 the name, specifically the ID of the answer and the ID of the button. A absolutely, absolutely. You, you could, uh, the, the student asked the question, I was saying that we would give the name of the button and the name of the um, answer as an argument. The student mentioned, given that all the answers and buttons are named basically the same, in other words, ANS followed by a number, BTN followed by a number, could we instead give a number and then form the ID, have a, have a JavaScript statement to make the ID um, equal, yeah, e equal ANS plus the value of the number argument. And we absolutely could do that. So we actually could do this with one argument, is, is kind of what you're saying. And again, yeah, we could, we could do that. Do keep in mind that this is sort of an introduction to programming for some person, so I want to, for some people in this class, so yeah, so I want to take it a step at a time. But that's absolutely a great point. All right, that's all I had for today. Um, we'll continue with this on Monday. If there's anything in particular in JavaScript that you're interested in seeing or seeing discussed, please send me uh, an email and I'll be glad to talk about it. I'm just going to survey through uh, just some very basic JavaScript functionality that demonstrate um, the basics of it. All right, we'll see you up in lab.